I really felt in my heart um, to preach on Daniel chapter 3. How many of you have heard about the fiery furnace? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I want to look tonight at the lives of these three Hebrew men in Daniel chapter 3. If you could turn with me uh, to Daniel chapter 3, verse 8. We're going we're gonna to read verse 8 through 12, but I don't want you to, when you get there, I'm not going to read it just yet. I'll let you know when I'm going to start reading that verse. But Daniel chapter 3, verse 8 through 12. Such an honor to be here. Thank you. We met at Roar Conference, me and Dale. And uh, what's funny is while you're turning to Daniel 3, I, I went to put his number in my phone and I already had his contact, which is really weird. I, I don't know how. Because I don't know any uh, strangers. I don't know any. Uh, maybe <laughs> I'm gonna, it was just meant to be, but his number was already in my phone. Praise the Lord. So we connected and uh, this man is such a father. Uh, to so many, and um, I'm excited to be here, so thank you for having me. It's always a privilege and an honor. I tell people that platforms are built by people's opinions. Pulpits are built by the Word of God. And so it's it's always an honor to preach the gospel. I don't take it lightly, and so I'm excited. But I trust you're there already, Daniel chapter 3. Now, I want to start preaching for a few minutes, and I'm going to read those verses. Um, but if you heard this story or you've had it read to you as a child, it's an incredible story. And, uh, and as we move through it, we can look at how real faith is uncompromising. There's so many messages you can get out of this passage of Scripture. But, uh, but I want to preach it with the Lord's place in my heart tonight. Amen? Amen? So there's this king, Nebuchadnezzar. He's mentioned by name around 90 times in the Bible, both historical and prophetic literature of the Hebrew Scriptures. History does not deny this man. Historians, anybody, they say Nebuchadnezzar absolutely was a king. He was a real king, and he has conquered much of the known world during this time. He's moved into Jerusalem, and he's burned down the temple, and he's taken the captives. And the, and the Babylonians, what they were great at was brainwashing people and mixing them into their culture. This is what they were good at. And as King Nebuchadnezzar, and he, as he moves into Jerusalem... He takes God's people, he takes them captive, those who were royal, those who were in the upper class, those who lived righteous lives, those people that everybody else looked up to. He gave them jobs and he fed them well. He, he bribed them with food. And he begins to brainwash the captives. And one way he does this is by changing the world they know, starting with their names. Now, I want you to, to follow with me. Another reason is because he wanted to change their identity. So he brings Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He wanted to change the way that they saw themselves. So he takes these three men who are in the upper class, who live righteous lives, and he offers them good lives. He takes Hananiah. Not many of you have known this, but those were not the real names. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I want to break it down here, what their names meant. He takes, uh, or was it Hananiah, which means God is gracious, and he changes his name to Shadrach, which means commander of the moon god. He takes Mishael, which means who is like God, and he changes his name to Meshach, which means who is like the moon god. He takes Azariah, which, mean, which means God has helped me, and changes his name to Abednego, which means servant of the god Nebu. Now, when I was studying this a few years back, I was blown away because I, I didn't know that that was not the real names. This is a revelation the Lord give, has, has given me. Um, I remember actually, this is one of my first sermons I've preached. Isn't that funny? Just preaching... One of my first sermons tonight, like five years ago, is when I first preached it at my home church. And the Lord spoke to me that He does not identify us as the problems that we struggle with. He does not identify you as depression. He does not identify you as lust. He does not identify you as anxiety. He identifies you as He calls you. Are you with me? How many people not here, you don't have to raise your hand, but struggle with who they are. They struggle with their identity. They, they struggle with, you know, things that they've gone through, ch childhood trauma, whatever it may be. And they take, they grow up with that trauma and they think that that's their identity when God calls us as He identifies us, identifies us not, not with the circumstance that we may be going through or what happened to us in our childhood. Amen. Are you hearing me? So these names were actually given to them when they were taken into cap captivity, which means, again, God, I'm telling you, He identifies you as He calls you. Right. See, the devil calls you by your sin. Right. He, knows, he knows your name, but He calls you by what you're struggling with. 
God knows what you're struggling with and he still calls you by your name. Isn't that powerful about the God that we serve? Anybody ever experienced the devil trying to just bring up old stuff? You ever think about that? Why is he trying to remind me of my past mistakes? You ever think of maybe it's because he doesn't want you to see what's ahead? He wants you to be so focused on what you went through or things that you failed at, mistakes you made, that you get your eyes off of first Jesus. But he doesn't, he doesn't want you to know that there's something powerful in your future. Are you hearing me? So many people struggle with condemnation and guilt and shame. But there's a difference. See, condemnation causes shame, but conviction causes repentance. I've learned that the enemy tries to condemn us for the purpose of separation. But the Holy Spirit convicts us for the purpose of restoration. Can I say that one more time? The enemy condemns us for the purpose of separation. He wants you to be separated from God. He does not want that commu communication between you and the Holy Spirit to flow. So he tries to condemn you. But the Holy Spirit convicts us because he wants to restore us. He wants us to be connected with God again. That's why I always tell people conviction is actually an invitation from God himself to restore fellowship back with him. Anybody thankful for yeah. conviction? Yeah. So he does not identify us as depression or anything that we struggle with. He identifies us as, we, as he calls us. Amen? That's some shouting stuff right there. He's a good, good God. So things didn't go so well. And I'm, I'm going to start preaching in just a moment. I get real passionate, real fired up. So I, I'm, I'm working my way there. But I want to I lay a foundation here and, uh, before I read Daniel chapter 3. But things didn't go so well for these three Hebrew men. They encountered the evil, but... Rather than giving in like everyone else around them, they challenged their situation. And I want to read cha Daniel chapter 3, verse 8 now. We're going to start reading it. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, May the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold. And that whoever does not fall down to worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. Verse 12. But there are some Jews. These are the people talking to King Nebuchadnezzar. Whom you have set up over the affairs of the province of Babylon. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Now, the people go into the office of King Nebuchadnezzar. He tells them and they start, you know... Uh, telling on these three Hebrew men and they decided what they decided to do was bind them up Before they put them in the furnace and we know that the furnace was equipped to kill them Actually Nebuchadnezzar was so mad. He actually looked at the three Hebrew men and he said is this true Shadrach Meshach and Abednego that you do not bow down to the image that I have set up and they said yeah That's true. We're not we're not bowing down we serve the true and living God. So King Nebuchadnezzar got so mad, the Bible records that he actually ordered the flames, Jay, to be heated seven times hotter. And they got their strongest soldiers to come and throw them into the fire. So they decided to bind them up. And I'm thinking to myself while reading this, why would you bind someone before you put them in a furnace? You see, because your hands are actually an instrument of praise. Which means that it's a weapon to use against the enemy. Come on, somebody. How many of you know that praise is your weapon? My pastor wrote a book called Praise is My Weapon. Worship is the password to your miracle. When you lift up your hands and you worship the God that you serve, something happens. Light enters darkness. And I tell people, you can't tell God who He is and God not tell you who you are. And that's what worship is, telling God who He is. And there's something that happens when you worship. And just because you're in the fire doesn't mean you don't have a weapon to use in order to get out. I believe that they knew those three Hebrew men were so powerful that they had to tie their hands together so they could not praise God. I believe it. But while reading this, if you think about it, if they, they tied them up. And God spoke to my heart a few years ago when I was studying this. And he said, there's some things that got you tied up. There's some things that got my people tied up. 
And you might be in here tonight and say, Matt, there's some things that got me tied up. I need deliverance. I need healing. But I want to tell you today that the deliverance that you're seeking isn't going to take place outside of the furnace. I believe that God is saying to us that the only way I'm going to get some of that stuff out of you is for you to get in the fire because in the fire, that's what that's where I'm going to burn that stuff out of you. See, the fire of God, that's what symbolizes His glory. His cleansing, His power, and the fire of the Holy Spirit. That's the same fire that burned up every trace of sin. And it's the same fire that burns up everything in your life that's not of God. I've, I've encountered so many people, in, interacted people. Many of you here today can testify of this, praying for somebody, them feeling a heat in their body. That's the fire of the Holy Spirit. It's what purifies us and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And it burns out everything that isn't of the Lord. The only way God can get some stuff out of us is for us to get in the fire. And I'm here tonight to tell you things may be heating up in your life. Things may be heating up in your family, in your marriage, in your finances, in your health. But I want to tell you today that God is still who He says He is. Things may be heating up in our nation right now, but how many know that Jesus is the answer to the problems of the world? You know, experience tells us that the world is broken and in need of repair. And sometimes its brokenness is rather obvious like today, but Jesus is still the answer and He's got a plan to fix this broken world. I'm telling you today, He's got a plan. How many know Isaiah 9, 6, it's still ringing in my ears the government will be upon his shoulders and he will be called the wonderful counselor the mighty God everlasting father the prince of peace come on somebody one day Jesus is going to set all things right and I believe the prince of peace will rule in true justice ushering in a time of blessing the world has ever seen I believe God is not done with America God is not done with his nation he's still going to have his way I believe revival has all it's it's here it's now and is coming Revival is now and is coming. How many believe that? A day is coming when the world's problems will be solved. Everything will be made new and peace will reign. And this is because of Jesus. And we eagerly await His return, trusting that the Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness, 2 Peter 3, 9 says. But He is patient with us, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And no matter what we need, Jesus is the answer for our lives today, and He promises a better future to come. How many believe that? Hallelujah.